Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Carl Koster. I'm the head of the Office of Corporate Relations at MIT and our industrial liaison program. And I'm very delighted uh, to uh, welcome you all here for another in our series of uh, uh, presentations by industry leaders in technology and management. Uh, today, as you know, we have uh, James Dyson, who's the inventor and founder of Dyson Corporation, who's brought, I can see, some uh, engineered accoutrements that I hope he'll uh, share with us. And uh, maybe there's a raffle at the end of it uh, for the, <laughs> but uh, well, well, but without further ado, let me introduce uh, the, uh, our Dean of Engineering, uh, Tom Agnanti, uh, one of uh, 14 Institute professors here. Uh, very well known for uh, developing a number of programs at MIT, uh, linking industry with MIT in many ways, including our Leaders for Manufacturing program, our Systems Design and Management program, uh, among others. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the Ameri American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Tom? Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, Often uh, making introductions at uh, MIT can be a little bit difficult, but today's is actually quite easy. Uh, as uh, Carl said, uh, this is a, a, a forum that's trying to bring together management and technology, and I can think of hardly anyone that, rec that represents this better than our speaker today. James Tyson, uh, I'm going to put uh, emphasis on the word inventor as well as founder of the D D Dyson Corporation. Uh, James and I had the opportunity to speak a little bit at lunch and he shared with me some of his passion for engineering, some of his passion for creating a, the excitement for this field, of attracting youth and young people to the field. Uh, and I think he's someone who is a role model, I think, for many young people in terms of what he's done. He's got a marvelous story to tell us, a story of uh, invention, commitment, passion, uh, and one that has led to some very significant technologies. Uh, and it gives me really enormous pleasure to introduce him to you today, James Tyson. Thank you. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, my particular passion for mixing engineering and design. Um, design in the past has been treated uh, as to how something looks. Uh, in other words, styling. I think that's rather an old-fashioned concept. I think design is about the technology in a product, um, how, how, how it's engineered, how you use it, and of course, how it looks and what it's like to use. Um, so I'll jump straight in to my first slide um, and talk about some of the influences I've had. And um, Isigonis, that rather shy man behind the car there, um, designed and engineered the Mini. So he, he did both functions. And the, the sketch on the right was done in 1958. And a great friend of mine was with him in Cannes, having sipping gin and tonic on a balcony at Louis overlooking the sea, and he drew this drawing of the Mini. And um, it's, it's interesting because, uh, I mean, not only has he drawn what the car's going to look like, the body, it's, it's 10 feet long, and it's supposed to carry four adults and lots of baggage, and I'll show you a little section in a minute of that. But he, had a, he put a transverse engine across the front here with a gearbox driving the front wheels, and that was a complete innovation. It hadn't been done before. And he also did a a rubber suspension unit here. But the, the most innovative thing probably were the small wheels. And he, um, he wanted to have small wheels because small wheels meant that you didn't have this horrible wheel arch going into the interior of the car, which took up so much space. You're probably not very familiar with that on modern cars, but old-fashioned cars were dominated by this enormous wheel arch coming into the interior of the body. Um, but the trouble with small wheels, there were two problems with small wheels. One was they thought the rolling resistance was higher for a small wheel. But they made a discovery that, in fact, if you pump the tires up harder, they had the same rolling resistance as larger wheels. So that, that was great. Um, and the other problem was the, the suspension rate of smaller wheels. And they solved that with having, by having rubber suspension rather than coil springs or leaf springs. And um, if I go on to the next slide. Uh, so here, here's how he did it. So he had the, this transverse engine driving the front wheels, this huge interior, not dominated by wheel arches, and there's the luggage in the back. And all along the side here, which you'll see on the next slide, yeah. I get to here, um, it's a very simple dashboard. No, um, there's no uh, door handle. You, to, to open the door, you pull a cord down and you sliding windows, which means that the, 
the exterior of the car, this is actually the exterior of the car. There's no, there's no panel there at all. And there's this huge compartment here. And he turned up at my friend's house. This is the friend who sat on the, the balcony at Cannes with him. And he had this, um, he said, come look at this. And he had this thing here, completely full of Gordon's gin. So there's a connection, you see, between designing sipping gin. And I rather like this. They made a big fuss when they launched it about the testing they'd done. Well, I mean, testing is now commonplace in cars, and they go all over the world to test things. But this is probably one of the first times it was done. And this was done in the Alps. And I think what's rather amusing is it's slightly reminiscent of the Italian job, which is, of course, a film later made of it. Um, I, I've been able to live now for almost but a half century Fuller, on the frontier like to just to listen to this. without anybody uh, guaranteeing me anything or telling me what to do. I've learned how to survive there, and one of the things I do is never to try to persuade anybody to, I don't try to, you don't try to sell anything. You, you uh, see what needs to be done and you do it. Pretty good advice, that. Um, I mean, I like Buckminster Fuller because he was a great inventor, he was a great designer, he was a great architect, a great engineer, and of course, he's famous for these wonderful light um, eggshell roof structures replacing previous much heavier much heavier sections. And he, he was, of course, um, a very green designer. I mean, probably the first green designer using far fewer materials and having his, his Dymaxian house rotating to face the sun. Um, but he just got on and did things, as he said. He didn't bother to sell them. He just did them. Uh, and so that my, that my two heroes, if you like, when I was at college was, were these two people who were great designers, revolutionary designers, engineers and inventors rolled into one. And although I was training as a designer, I took off at the end of my design course and went to work for an engineering company to learn engineering and R&D. And this is um, one of the first projects I worked on. Now, um, I went water skiing with another friend, and we were pulling his daughter behind the boat. And we noticed that, um, I mean, you would think that flash man there is going much faster than this man with whom you have much more sympathy. In fact, he's going a lot faster than he is. And uh, that's what we noticed. And we were surprised, because we thought that the mono skier would go much better than the, the, the two skis. So we then took the, we had a huge motor cover on the boat, which is a large eight by four sheet of plywood. And we put his daughter on that and towed her. And she went even faster. And this seems slightly counterintuitive. But what we then um, looked it up in a book and found that um, this is a, it's all done in feet, it's quite an old thing, but th this is the width of hull that you need for the load you're carrying. So a person is 180 pounds, 170 pounds, and you need a two foot, the, ide the ideal planing hull for that weight is something two foot wide. Of course, a mono ski is much less. Two skis get you, gets you to about that, but you ski that wide, two foot wide, about that wide. And um, it gave us an idea for doing a boat, a boat that was like a truck that went on the water. And I think if I, yeah, here we are. Uh, and that's, that's the boat we developed, which is really a huge flat sheet of plywood. It's actually made of fiberglass, but in essence, it's a huge flat sheet with skegs along the side, which, trap, uh, which you can see just up there. It has side skegs. That's, that's rather a bad illustration, actually. They're much smaller than that. But it traps bubbles underneath the hull as it planes. And because it's trapping bubbles underneath it, it removes the frictional resistance. In ship design, you have two problems. You have wave-making drag at sub-planing speeds. And then once you're up and planing, your wave-making drag goes, and you have frictional resistance. If you trap bubbles underneath like that, you enormously reduce the frictional resistance. So our boat was able to go very fast. And um, so if you look at the top here, it went fast because it was getting all the pressure from the water, all the effect, whereas a V-hull dissipates it. So a V-hull is not a very efficient planing hull. It's very stable because it's wide and flat. Uh, we, we happened to put foam inside, so it was unsinkable. And then um, it had very shallow draft, of course, because it's flat, whereas the V-hull obviously draws much more water. So it could land right on the beach, as you saw the soldiers doing there. And then it, it has this very practical rectangle, which is very good for loading a jeep or even two Jeeps on it. And it would go, to give you an idea, it would go about 60 miles an hour um, and with soldiers on it. 
With a couple of jeeps, it would do about 45 miles an hour, which is very fast for a boat and with relatively small engines. Um, we then had the problem of selling it. Uh, people described it as a Welsh dresser on water because it, it just didn't look like a boat. Um, and in fact, the first one I sold was this one for building the Bosporus Bridge in Turkey. Um, and then we sold one on the Royal Yacht. Uh, so the, the Queen had a red carpet which rolled down onto the beach so she could walk off. Um, this one, uh, I supplied several, actually, to the, Israel, the Egyptian Special Boat Squadron. And they, I was out there, I took this photo, and they had a Russian jeep. And we had wheels that clamped on the side so you could tow it across the land. And um, I was out there doing speed trials, and they wanted to mount uh, what sounded like a huge cannon on the side of the boat. They didn't tell me what it was, but they told me what it weighed. So we had to make the boat go as fast as possible. Um, with this particular weight on it. Um, I left, and about two weeks later, two weeks later they stormed Sinai and used the, um, a cannon to spray Simon Prong, which is a quick-setting French cement, over the napalm outlets that the Israelis had down the Gulf of Sinai. And then the troops followed, and they uh, achieved quite a remarkable victory, actually. Then no one thought they could get into Sinai, but they did. And I'm afraid it's our boats that did it. But when I'm not partisan in this, we also supplied the Israelis with quite a lot of boats. Uh, we, did, we did get into trouble about that, but anyway. Th there it is with two Land Rovers going, going to about 45 miles an hour. Um, now, um, I'd used a wheelbarrow at home because I'd bought a house and I was doing it up. And I noticed that the wheel was terribly narrow and used to sink into the soft ground. And the the feet of the wheelbarrow used to, you know, you'd load it up and the feet would sink in and the thing would tip over. And the nasty metal bin would damage the door jams when you went into a door and that bash your knees. Altogether, it wasn't, a, and it rusted and cement stuck to it. So as I was doing this manual work, I thought, well, really, it should have a balloon-type tire and a plastic dumper truck body made of polythene so it, cement won't stick to it and it won't rust. And uh, so I started making wheelbarrows, got into the wheelbarrow business. Of course, no one would buy it because it was a rather strange looking thing. And I think the retailers thought there was something slightly sexual about the ball. So they, they wouldn't stock it. So I started selling it through those, um, you know, those little advertisements in the newspapers for incontinence pants and baldness cures, you know, the sort of thing. I did little advertisements there and started selling it. Actually, people sent in checks. So it was very successful. And then we got to bigger advertisements, and then the shop started taking it. And we got about um, 50 or 60% of the wheelbarrow market at about uh, three times the price of conventional wheelbarrow, which was actually an important point to learn from a product point of view, an inventor's point of view, in that uh, you're usually told that to get a big market share, you have to be very cheap. What I learned from this experience, although the wheelbarrow market is very small, is that that isn't true. You can get a very big share of the market. As long as you have good engineering, as long as you've got a good thing to sell, you can get a big share of the market at a high price. Um, and then I did a boat launching trolley using the, the balls. Um, and I put seat webbing across so that the trolley would fit any shape of hull and not damage it. In order to make my claim that it would fit any shape of hull, I had to, of course, try it on every shape of hull which is a rather difficult thing to do. So I found this reservoir, where, which has had a very big sailing club. And I used to go there in, uh, at night, at midnight, and secretly try my trolley on everybody's um, hulls. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, we're there. Did I jump to? Yeah. Right. Uh, that's, that's it. Right. Um, when we'd been developing the sea truck, we realized that that was the, the boat that went across water, that actually a lot of people who wanted to buy it were people who wanted to patrol the water, like the police or the army or the customs officers. And what they really wanted was something they could keep on the land, which could go across the beach. It didn't have to go up a road, but could scoot along the water. And so what I tried to do was... Uh, a vehicle that both floated on and was propelled by its wheels. Um, so the aim was to look to look like it would be a vehicle looking a bit like this. And uh, that's Rommel on there, by the way, 120th Rommel. 
Um, and so uh, I started developing wheels, float flotation wheels, that had paddles on them. And this is an early version of it. I just want to say a little bit about this rather crude looking rig here. It cost about $200. I mean, at that time, in order to develop something maritime, you had to go to a special research lab in order to do it. But I just built a very simple rig in my backyard. I got a, a Black & Decker here, driving a shaft to the wheel. I, I had water pouring in here, because it was obviously splashing water out a bit. And then the wire went up to the first floor window, where I had a variac and an AVO meter, so I could control the speed and the power going into the wheel. Um, and as I say, it cost $200, very cheap. Anyone can do it. And um, I started experimenting with different shaped paddles and so on. And uh, what I was doing originally was a Mississippi paddle steamer, which is actually very, very efficient. It's more efficient than a propeller. The trouble was I found that it had limited speed. And I'd noticed in centrifugal fans that um, you would expect the blade to, be, to move a lot of air, to be f sort of like that, in, uh, so it could scoop a lot of air. In fact, a centrifugal fan, the blade is bent backwards. It's rather counterintuitive. It doesn't look as though it would be very efficient at moving air. Um, so in desperation, because I couldn't get the paddle wheel to go more than about six miles an hour, I imitated the, the centrifugal fan and bent the blades backwards and was amazed to see the wheel jump out of the water and skip across the top of the water. Um, it had become a kind of planing wheel. Um, and I then went down to the sea and built a similar type of rig with a Ford engine there. And uh, that, that four of those wheels would go 35 miles an hour carrying one ton driven by a Ford engine. I mean, here, I'm only driving one wheel, but it is going 30 miles an hour around the pontoon. Um, and uh, I just brought along some examples of the kind of recording of the test that I was doing. So each test would have a sheet like this with the numbers written on it. And then from that, I would make up a graph. And uh, here's some of the wheels I was testing. And there's the colors, which shows what the line is. Uh, and then there's the much bigger wheel. And there's the, this is the type of size of wheel you would need as the vehicles got bigger and bigger. Um, and I, one of the points I wanted to make is that these type of handwritten graphs are often a lot better than computer graphs because they, they mean more. You can get more into them. So um, although I sound a little bit Luddite, and we do lots and lots of computer graphs at home, at work, um, I often hanker after these much older graphs, which always seem to illustrate a lot more to me. Um, now, we were asked to design a wheelchair, and uh, electric wheelchair. Now, a convention, one of the problems of wheelchairs is getting over curbs and doorsteps and so on. And a, a regular wheel, when it does that, can't get over it. Um, if you lay the same wheel on its side, it goes over very easily. And that's because when you put the, the wheel on its side, it assumes a diameter a lot bigger than it actually is. So you can get a relatively small wheel on its side, which makes a very neat package, actually go over quite a big curb. And um, so we made a wheelchair with these four angled wheels, each with a motor on it, a windscreen wiper motor off a car, very cheap. And then um, the steer, I'll try to show you how it steers, actually. Uh, and then a the fifth motor to steer it. And it's very easy to steer, because it's it's going along like this, and you just do that, and it goes along like that. So it actually steers very easily. And what's nice about it is it makes a, um, a, uh, a very flat platform. So one of the requirements of this wheelchair was that it could fold up and go easily go into a car. So we had a, a motorized platform, and then the battery box, batteries here, and then a fold-away chair here. And it was all controlled by this acrylic rod, which you just twisted to steer. Uh, rather than having a joystick. Uh, now, vacuum cleaners. I mean, as a child, I was made to vacuum the house, and I had one of those machines with a sort of sack on the back, a rather disgusting sack, cloth sack hanging on the back. And I remember it making a screaming noise and smelling this awful smell of stale dust and stale dog, and having to bend down and pick things up that um, like these various people are doing. 
pick things up that it wouldn't suck up. Um, and then when I had a, my own house, I bought what was allegedly the most powerful vacuum cleaner in the world. And uh, I took it home and was using it. It was fine for the first room. By the time I got to the third room, I had this deja vu experience of when I was seven, vacuuming at home as a child. This terrible smell of stale dog and stale dust, screaming noise, and I was having to bend down and pick things up that it wouldn't suck up. So I, um, I took the bag out. I couldn't find a spare one. So I emptied the bag into the dustbin uh, and sort of opened the end and tipped all the dust out and then scotch taped it back together again and put it back in the machine, pushed it along, and I still had no suction. And I thought, that's very odd. The bag's empty. Uh, they tell me that I should stop the machine and empty the bag in order to get the suction back. I've emptied the bag. I haven't got the suction bag. What's going on here? And I suddenly realized that all the airflow that went through the vacuum cleaner had to go through the bag. I kind of rather stupidly thought before that that the bag was a sort of depository where the dust landed and the suction depended on the power of the motor. What I realized this, this Saturday morning was, in fact, that all the airflow had to go through the bag. And it's the first fine dust that goes into the bag that blocks the little holes in the bag or the filter if it's a filter vacuum cleaner. And so the vacuum cleaner starts losing its suction dramatically from the first moment you use it, that there's the sort of lining of the bag with the fine dust or the lining of the filter. So actually, it starts losing suction immediately. So if you have a graph, it's doing that straight away. Um, and the bag full indicator is not a bag full indicator at all. It's a, it's a pressure indicator. And of course, as the, as the bag clogs, the pressure rises. And all those indicators you see are pressure switches. They're not bag full indicators. They're bag clogged indicators. And I felt pretty angry about this, actually. That there's, I felt was conned about this bag full business. But also, um, there are very few products which uh, start and then drop in performance so dramatically. You know, a light bulb gives 100 watts till it goes pop. And your car goes 70 miles an hour down the road until something terrible happens. There are very few products that have this terrible deteriorating performance. And it's all because of this filter membrane clogging. So um, one day, um, I went to a lumber yard and saw this great cyclone on the roof and noticed it was collecting the sawdust from all around the, the, the factory all day long without ever apparently clogging. So I knew a little bit about cyclones and I knew that they separated by centrifugal force. This film, by the way, was taken by a Japanese man who climbed into a cyclone, one of those very big cyclones. It's very, one of those, that one, in fact. It's very brave of him. Um, and so I wondered if the principle would work on a, uh, a smaller scale. Um, and so I went home and started building little... Actually, well, the first thing I did was to... I had one of those old vacuum cleaners with a sack up the back. And uh, I ripped that off and made a cardboard cyclone, a sort of little model about a foot high of the one I'd seen on the sawmill. And I connected it via, via a hose to the, where the bag connected. And I sort of tacked it all together with wire, strapped it to the vacuum cleaner, and pushed along the world's first cyclonic vacuum cleaner with no loss of suction. Um, I then decided this is a very good idea and started developing prototypes. Um, I thought it would take me about six months. In fact, it took me four and a half years, and I built 5,127 prototypes until I got it right. And it, it, that sounds tedious. In fact, it was absolutely fascinating. I mean, each failure, each, the 5,126 5, failures taught me so much. Successes teach you nothing. Failures teach you everything. <coughs> Making mistakes is the most important thing you can do. And I do think that schools get it wrong by marking people who give the correct answers. I think they should mark people who get the wrong answer but learn something from it. But that's a... Another point. But I think we engineers know that you only learn things by making mistakes. And you only learn things by going to the lab, into the workshop, building things and observing things and seeing what happens. You don't get it by sitting at a drawing board or lying in the bath. You only get it by building things. Um, so I built my 5,127 prototypes over four and a half years and got it to work. I then was heavily in debt to the bank, so I had to go out and sell my technology. Um, a, Jap a funny little Japanese company was the first company to take, take up the license. And we built this pink and lavender vacuum cleaner in 1986. It went on the market for $2,000 in Japan. And they don't really buy upright vacuum cleaners in Japan. They buy tiny little 
this is our Japanese product. They don't buy great big things like this. They buy tiny little things like that. But nevertheless, they sell quite a few at $2,000. Um, and they love these all-night meetings. And um, this, is, uh, this is about 4 o'clock in the morning. They talk amongst themselves in Japanese and then negotiate a point with me in five minutes every hour. And so I got a bit bored and took a photo. And they, hand, they were very nice people. They hand up. Uh, and I think... <laughs> Well, that's quite enough of that. But um, what, what was interesting, I, I don't know why they were using Western models to promote a Japanese-made product in Japan, designed by a British inventor. I don't know anyway, but that's how they did it. Um, and then uh, I did a few, I did license agreements in North America and license agreement in Canada. And then I decided that license agreements were um, boring, the wrong word, I suppose. They were, um, they were all about legal things. They weren't really about improving the product and doing continuous development. And so I wanted to make the vacuum cleaner myself, so I set up production in England. I went to raise money to do it, and uh, I went to all the usual venture capitalists and merchant bankers, and they wouldn't back me because I was an engineer. I, they didn't like the fact that it was a vacuum cleaner, but when they got over that, they said, we're not giving you the money because you're an engineer. They said, if you get someone in from the industry, um, to do it, then we'll back you. I said, but I want to do it. You know, I thought of it. Uh, it's my idea. I want to do it. And they said, well, you can't have the money then. Um, but anyway, so I went and borrowed it from a regular clearing bank, a high street bank. I borrowed um, about a million and a half dollars. Um, they were completely mad lending it to me, but they did. And that wasn't really enough money. I didn't have any money for stock. I didn't have enough money for a factory. I didn't have any money for advertising. I had just enough money for the tooling. Uh, which was about a million and a half dollars. Um, so I had to borrow a factory. I had to get someone to make it for me, but not make any stock. And then I went out to sell it. And when I went out to sell it, um, the retailers, again, you know, well, who are you? You're Dyson. You're, you're, not a, you're not an Electrolux or a Hoover or a Panasonic. We're not putting your product in our shops. Um, one person... Uh, finally said, it was a mail order catalogue, they, they said, um, why should we, it was quite an interesting man, he, he made me demonstrate it to him all day long, he made me go out and get some black currant juice and spill it on the carpet and clean it up, he made me do all sorts of things. But by about six o'clock in the evening, he said, why should I take out a Hoover or an Electrolux um, and put a Dyson in my catalogue? And so I said, because your catalogue is boring. And he said, you're very cheeky, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll try it. So that was, that was my first customer. So sometimes you have to get a little bit aggressive um, in selling. And uh, within two years, I'll, I'll show you the chart in a minute, but in two years, we've become Britain's best-selling vacuum cleaner, uh, without any advertising, by the way, because I didn't have any money for that. Um, now, in, um, I just wanted to show you this slide, because we, we continue to develop the product. And um, in November 1977, we launched a completely transparent vacuum cleaners. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about that. You'll notice that the bin is transparent. Now, one of the things the retailers said to us was that you'll never sell a vacuum cleaner where you can see the dirt. It's quite disgusting. So we did a focus groups, and um, I hate focus groups, but the focus groups said, uh, you know, it's disgusting. No one wants to see the dirt. But we as engineers really enjoyed our time in the laboratory, watching the dust collect. You know, it's a sort of a vicarious fascination. It's a bit like those German laboratories where you do your bit on a sort of platform and you examine it before flashing it away. <laughs> so, um, so we just decided to ignore the retailers and the market research, and we sold it with a clear bin. And, of course, you push the vacuum cleaner around the floor, and... Um, you know, dirt comes up inside, and it's quite interesting. I don't know how clean this floor is, but... Um, uh, we'll, see, we'll see how clean it is, but... Pretty disgusting, I'd say, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, I mean, it's sort of seeing it collect is fun. And, and satisfying, you know, you've, you've done something useful rather than just pushing around this thing which makes this nasty smell and so on. Ours doesn't make any smell, by the way, because 
the dirt's separated out of the airflow. So the air that goes through passes through a clean, unobstructed space, so the air is absolutely fresh. Um, anyway, I've jumped a slide, which I didn't mean to do. Come back to this one. So we got very excited about the see-through idea and decided to make the entire vacuum cleaner see-through. And at that time, an interesting new material called Turlux was coming in, where you had these rather nice sort of transparent colors. And so we did the entire vacuum cleaner like that. Now, I put the date up here because um, Jonathan Ives bought one of these when it was for sale in England, this one on the right here, and asked me to send another one over to, for Steve Jobs. And as you know, the iMac came out a short while afterwards, <laughs> which is absolutely fine. I don't mind any of that. But um, the, the problem is that Japanese journalists come into my office and they say, ah, oh, you copy iMac. So I have to put them right on that. So I'm just putting the record straight for you here. Um, this, sorry, it's a rather boring marketing point, but um, these, these are our rivals, and this is us starting off. Very low sales, because we haven't got any distribution. So getting distribution was important. And then once we got distribution, it, it shot up, and we mucked around up there, according to whether we could supply enough or not, because we had real problems supplying all our vacuum cleaners. Now, th this, this graph is, um, is volume. And this one over here is value. Uh, and this is the point I was making earlier, really. My slightly unsuccessful experience with the wheelbarrow showed that I could sell a product at a much higher price in greater volume if it had better technology. So here, I'm selling a vacuum cleaner at a much higher price. And you think I'd sell fewer, because in order to sell a lot, I should sell it very cheaply. But in fact, um, you know, this is a much better business to have than one of these because you've got a lot, you're making a lot more profit, you can plow a lot more back into R&D and really move forwards. But you know, you've got to have better technology in order to be able to get people to spend a lot more money, you know, two or three times the price, the amount of money on your product than, than the ordinary ones. Um, now this is Hoover's reaction um, on British television when we launched our product. I do regret that Hoover as a company did not take the product technology off the shelf take it off Dyson, and it would have lain on the shelf and not have been used. So what about now? Would you consider a cyclonic ah. arrangement like his now? Uh, well, in terms of cyclonic arrangement, it has some benefits. He's exploited them, uh, but he has patented them. So even if we chose well, to go... Well, actually, they did copy it. And that's it. That's their copy. Um, and uh, I'm sure you all know about patents. I mean, patents are the way we protect our inventions. And it's not a very good system, but it is a system. Um, the problem with it as a system is that it's very expensive to file and maintain patents. A typical patent costs at least $100,000, $200,000 to file. Then every year you have to pay a renewal fee in every country where you have it patented. And in Germany, for example, they're $3,000 a year to renew a patent. Same in Holland. So it's a very, very expensive business patenting and paying renewal fees. But what becomes absolutely impossible is when you have to sue somebody. This case in the British courts cost about um, $10 million. And it's just about resolved now, I think, seven years later. And that was one of the most significant, I mean, it was a very clear victory in a patent case, which is rare. And we got the largest settlement in patent history in Britain. It was a very clear victory. But most victories aren't as clear as that. Now, what worries me about this is that individual inventors and small businesses can't afford this. It's essentially an anti-competitive system. That's, what, that's what's wrong with it. We need a much simpler system, like musicians' copyright or authors' copyright. A musician or an author has copyright for their lifetime and 70 years after their death without paying a penny. And they usually have a body to, to help them fight their case. Inventors have none of that. We have it for 20 years at the most, and we have to pay through the nose throughout that 20 years and pay enormous amounts of money to fight um, patent actions. So it's a system, and we have to use it, but it's a rather imperfect system. And certainly doesn't help the small inventor, the individual, or small business. Um, we've gone on to develop our technology. We now have multi-cyclones, which you see going in here. I mean, they're quite complex um, systems, where you, you send the air into eight different cyclones, and they bring it all back together again. Highly complex, but because of injection molding, plastic and so on, you can do all these sort of things really quite cheaply. Um, 
This, is, this cylinder, canister type of vacuum cleaner, I think you call it, is what we sell everywhere else in the world. Only the, um, only the British and the North Americans buy upright vacuum cleaners. And that's because only the British and um, North Americans have fitted carpets, which is what uprights were traditionally used for. Um, Britain is about half uprights and half canisters. And it's in your genes, if you're it's, it's gen congenital. I mean, if, if your mother had a, an upright, you'll have an upright. If she had a canister, you'll have a canister. And you can't change it, I'm afraid. That's, that's the way of the world. Um, uh, here again, this sh the, the thing about the cyclone, the, the original one had a, one big cyclone in the middle. Um, a smaller cyclone has a tighter radius, and therefore you get greater centrifugal force, and therefore greater ability to separate dust. The problem is that you can't get all the airflow through a smaller cyclone. So, but if you have multiple small cyclones, then you can divide the airflow up, and therefore separate the dust more efficiently with, small, with multiple small cyclones than you can with one big one. So that was the advance that we made, um, as you can see on this machine. Uh, and then we did um, some other things. We, we have uh, the, this instant um, hose wand so that you can clean the edges. You don't need a canister cleaner. You can do it all with an upright. And uh, I think there's a... I got a 14. Yeah, that's fine. This is a, this one just, I uh, you know, should have taken that off first. This one does the same thing. So you've got instantly got a, you can do the edges and so on. Uh, and then the ball vacuum cleaner. Um, one of the problems with uh, the sort of conventional type of vacuum cleaner is in order to use it and turn a corner, you have to keep moving around. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm doing a kind of seesaw action to get round something. So you have to walk about three times as far and do a lot of pushing and maneuvering. With this one, the ball, which is what this is all about, uh, you just walk with it, you see, and you... Uh, all I'm doing is just twisting my arm. And you can go between your legs, you can do whatever you like. It's just a, very, very maneuverable. Um, but it meant... Uh, it meant rethinking a lot of the vacuum cleaner. We had to have an, it has to be very stable, because when you use the, um, the wand, it, it mustn't fall over when you, when you go up the stairs. It must follow you around and not fall over. Um, but that's sort of inconsistent with, uh, that's inconsistent with um, the sort of total freedom that you got with the ball. Uh, so we, we had to design an undercarriage that went down automatically when you, when you put it in the upright position and which then hitched up when you took off again. It also has a, if you watch this, it, it changes the airflow from the brush bar to the hose automatically. If you watch, you see that valve switch over. So quite a lot happens when you put it in the upright position. The other thing that happens is you, when you go into the upright position, the brush bar switches off so it's not digging a hole in the carpet while you're using the hose and the wand. Um, so they're all, they're all quite interesting little things that happen automatically. You're not aware of it when you buy it, but they're interesting little developments. And, um, you know, making the, uh, hey, the dust so it's easier to empty is, uh, is very important. So all those little developments, that improvements that, that uh, we've done over the years. Um, oh yes, this is showing the... The, when, it, when it's actually swiveling, you, ha you have to keep the head flat on the floor. So there's, there's quite a lot of interesting, there's a gimbal there. And the gimbal locks when you get into the upright position. And we've done a, a motor down by the brush bar, which drives the, the brush bar with gears rather than the belt. So you never get a belt failure, which is a real problem with normal vacuum cleaner. Um, and the motor's actually in the ball, because uh, we want a low center of gravity. Uh, and so that you don't have the, the heavy motor in the body of the machine, which makes it heavy to push around. Uh, and actually, the, the motor stays stationary, and the ball goes around the outside of the motor casing. And all the air has to come in the ball and then go out of the ball again. Uh, so there's some quite interesting technical challenges. Uh, this shows the undercarriage I was talking about. Now, testing is interesting. I mean, it, Mechanical test rigs are, are very easy, 
but with vacuum cleaners, real people use vacuum cleaners. So um, in Malaysia, where our factories are, we have 150 people testing vacuum cleaners 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, is that the, and this is the kind of, you'll, you'll see bits of the user course. Um, we have robots, of course, but you really need people testing things. And um, it sounds incredibly boring. Actually, it's fascinating. I mean, it's very noisy in there because of all the machines running, but everybody's smiling because they, they do whatever they're doing, say, 150 times, and they take a photograph and write notes, and they're discovering things. They're discovering what works and what doesn't work. And actually, it's very, very interesting. And I, I love going there and just, just seeing what's happening. You know, how long does it take to break a hose like that? Where does it break? You know, why does it break? Uh, you know, if you, if you do that, as most of our customers do every day, you know, how long does it take to break it? And um, with rapid prototyping now, um, and we have lots of test machines, you know, tumble rigs and that sort of thing, and we put vacuum cleaners through completely unreasonable tests using SLS prototypes and um, at the early stage. So we, we spend a huge amount of money. We might build 100 or 150 SLS prototypes of an early model costing maybe a million dollars. And we not only put those out in homes, but we put them through these sort of very unreasonable user courses. Now, things break, things go wrong. Um, and usually, by a simple design change, rather than added cost, you can cure the problem. So, um, you know, we do a lot of this sort of thing, hitting things with hammers. See, um, you go around a hammer, with, go around the machine with a hammer hitting it. Now, if it breaks, you make a, often, by making a simple design change, you can stop it breaking. So whatever anyone does, um, they won't break it. And uh, because we do all that, we have the lowest return rate of any vacuum cleaner sold in the United States. It's entirely due to those 150 wonderful people trying to smash it and recording what happened with the camera and uh, notebook. Now, I've jumped onto washing machines. It's obviously, the screen is getting bored with vacuum cleaners. Now, there are two types of washing machine, a front loader and a top loader. And um, that's the front loader, where the clothes go round like that horizontally. The top loader here, um, the, there's a paddle that turns in the middle of the wash tub, wearing out the clothes that are adjacent to the paddle. It doesn't do much else. Now, my mother, she looks like my grandmother there, but my mother had one of those. And that's a boiler and a mangle. Now, actually, we discovered um, that these machines are really not much more effective than my grandmother's machine. They spin the water out, which is very much better than my grandmother's machine. She had a mangle. But actually, they're much the same in performance. And uh, we did a little test. We, um, as a European standard for cleanliness called the IEC standard. And um, we did a, an IEC standard test on the most expensive German washing machine, a Miele, and then washing by hand. We discovered that 15 minutes of washing by hand got a better wash than two and a quarter hours in a Miele. And uh, then we started to analyze why that was. And we discovered that it was actually flexing the clothes that made the clothes clean. But the, neither of these two machines actually flex the clothes. So we tried to find various ways of flex. Th th there's the hand washing, you see. We have, we've actually ended, that that's what happens in an ordinary front loader. Um, now, we then tried various methods of flexing the clothes. We tried compressing them. We tried rotating them at high speed in a little drum. We tried microwaving them. We tried various sort of Heath Robinson arrangements here to the sort of rubber drum. We even tried a huge rubber sack, which we pummeled with various devices. But then, um, then one day, we thought of the idea of making the drum go faster, because the faster the washing machine drum goes, the better the wash until the point where there's so much centrifugal force that the clothes stick to the drum. So we, we thought we'd build a rig knocking them down. So the clothes would get up to the top, we'd knock them down, and they'd drop to the bottom of the drum, then come back up again. But we had to split the drum in order to do that. We had to build two drums and put the paddle in the middle. And as we were making this rig, and this is the rig here, actually, we thought, let's not bother with the paddle. Let's try sending the drums in opposite directions, contra-rotating them, which is exactly what we did. And we got exactly the answer we wanted. And uh, we got this wonderful manipulation of the clothes that you see going on here. Uh, this, this is our, the rig we built. Again, it's, it's a very, very simple washing machine demonstrating wash performance. It's just two motors, some chains, 
uh, two very simple drums with acrylic ends, so we can see what's going on, and uh, a wooden tub of water. But it, you know, you don't have to build a proper washing machine. You can build a very simple rig using very little money to develop a new type of washing machine. Um, and so it has two, you can see it there, it has the two drums contra-rotating. Uh, and I think you'll see the assembly. It, it has two motors uh, and it has an epicyclic gearbox at the back. And after it's done its wash cycle, it locks the two drums together and does the high-speed spin with the drums locked together. There's, you can see the epicyclic gearbox at the back there. And then uh, a very large door. And then what, one of, I think one of the important things, um, oh, sorry, the, we, we also developed, we put two little pizzas on, which gave vibration feedback at slow speeds. That was, that was very important. That was one of our inventions because we can very easily redistribute the load. Now, with front-loading washing machines, um, you can spin much faster and much more effectively than you can with top loaders. And uh, this machine gets up to about 1,800 RPM, which is very, very fast. But when you do that, if you have an off-center load, um, I went to um, have supper with uh, a friend of mine, and um, I, he had a plumbing leak in his stables, and I went around the back to, to help him fix the plumbing leak. And I noticed his Dyson was sitting there, and it had six pairs of riding boots in it. And uh, six pairs of riding boots full of water on one side of the drum, when you go into spin, it exerts about four, 40 tons of lateral force, enormous lateral force. So it's very important before you go into the spin to redistribute the load so it's evenly spread. And we use these pizzas to detect vibration at slow speeds. In, and then we just redistribute the load. And if we have improved the vibration, then we can go up into the fast spin. But the purpose of that is to speed up the wash cycle and make sure you don't destroy the machine in the process. Um, so this, this shows the, the two spiders that you have, a spider for the inner drum and a spider for the front drum, epicyclic gearbox. There you can see the whole assembly together. Sorry? How do you seal these um, They just run very close with a, with a nylon seal around the center, but they're, they're not rotating very fast against each other in the contra-rotation mode. It's only 20 RPM or something, so there's no great friction there. Good question, though. But w one of the other things we did, I mean, I always think it's very important to solve not just the main problem you're trying to solve, in this case, you know, do a better wash much more quickly, because we're, 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 I think, a third of the time of the media machine, and we do a better wash. But, you know, have you ever tried to pull a washing machine out from the slot it's in? And all, all we did was just put a little cam action and a roller underneath. So you pull the handle out, and then you can pull the washing machine. I mean, she's pulling the washing machine, which is a very heavy washing machine, actually, ours was, um, anywhere she likes. So just little things, whether it's the hose or whatever it is, I think it's terribly important to rethink everything, not just do, do the main thing you're doing. And it's, um, you can't actually... When you come to sell something, you can only talk about one thing because you lose everybody if you start talking about more than one thing. So when I talk about my vacuum cleaner, I only talk about no loss of suction because to get my message across to 250 million people about no loss of suction is very difficult. I haven't got much time to do it and not much money. But I, I can't tell you about the, the hose and all the other wonderful things I think I've done. I'd love to tell you about them. But I put them in there, not because it helps sell the vacuum cleaner, but when you get the vacuum cleaner or the washing machine at home, you start to notice all these things. And I hope you then become a proselytizer for it. But uh, a lot of people wouldn't bother to put those things in because they can't sell them. That doesn't help sell products. But I think, of course, it does help sell products because people like the machine and are surprised when they get home to find the little things they hadn't noticed in the shop. Um, vacuum cleaner motors are... A, source of great problems. In fact, electric motors are source of problems full stop. And this type of conventional motor has brushes. And the, 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 the motor goes round because, as you know, those brushes, each of those copper strips there is separated and insulated from the other. And all these windings are insulated. So the, the brushes put continuous current into the commutator. And this, these form a switching effect. So it it urges the motor round, and that's how an electric motor works. Um, now, we decided to, that that motor had lots of problems. For a start, a lot of carbon comes out, which is very nasty stuff. It's not toxic stuff. 
Um, it's that kind of black dust you see around your appliance um, when it's, as it's getting older. And it's not very nice to breathe it in. Um, the insulation breaks down and the motor fails. That's the most common motor failure. And these um, copper strips can fall off. And those are the sort of problems we have with conventional motors in our vacuum cleaners. So we decided to do our own. And we developed what is called a switch reluctance motor or a digital motor. So the, instead of having this complicated business in the center, we have a very simple iron core. And instead of having brushes, we um, pass a current across the machine um, with, a, with a chip. And the current is switched um, about 6,500 times a second. And so it's called a switch reluctance motor. So you're urging the motor around by switching on and off. I mean, this one switches it on and off, but it does it rather laboriously. A chip can do it rather beautifully. Um, this, this motor goes um, at about 30,000 RPM. Your Black & Decker drill goes about 17,000 RPM. So a vacuum cleaner motor is very fast anyway. A Ferrari does about 19,000 RPM at full throttle. Uh, this one, which we got in our Japanese machine here, does 110,000 RPM. And because it's going so fast, you can make it half the weight and half the size. So we produced a motor that actually has nothing to go wrong with it. It's controlled by electronics, and um, it lasts forever, and it's half the weight and half the size. That took about 11 years to develop before we got it on the market. We're selling it in, in this nice little machine in Japan, and it's got a very nice feature, which is that... Um, if you hold the on button down and put your mobile phone against it, uh, having dialed the number on top of the machine, um, it goes through our phone system and comes up on our computers in our helpline. And it downloads the serial number of the machine, the data manufacturer, and the, um, if you've registered, your name and address comes up as well. So you don't actually have to say anything. You don't have to do that awful thing of giving them your serial number and the date you bought it and all that crap. We know that. We've got that. Um, and um, we, if there's something wrong with it, we can pretty well detect what's wrong with it because a motor tells you just about everything that's going on in a vacuum cleaner. So we might be able to say to you, ah, Mrs. Smith of 24 Acacia Avenue, you've probably got your hose blocked. Why don't you check to see if there's a sock in it or something like that? So it's a sort of early form of um, interconnectivity, but it's immediate. It's happening at the moment in Japan, and we'll be bringing it here soon, I hope. Um, but it's a, a nice um, a benefit from having a chip controlling the motor because the chip can store all the data of its usage, its DNA, and everything. And uh, very simply, with a binary signal like a fax machine, transmit it through a phone into our computers at work. Uh, yeah, well, here, actually, here it is operating. There's, those are the brushes working. And then I think this shows the brushes wearing down, which they do after about four to 600 hours. And then the, the motor's absolutely useless. Whereas ours just passes a signal across this, the, the iron, um, as I say, six, six and a half thousand times a second. Why is the motor different from a normal Oh, well, um, actually, sorry, this is, this is how it works. Well, it, it doesn't work. A normal brushless motor works using magnets to urge it round. We, we don't have any magnets. It's a very simple, very cheap, very crude iron motor, uh, completely controlled by a chip. The problem is the electronics are very expensive, but we're gradually reducing that. At the moment, it's about three times the cost of a normal motor. But I hope within about a year or so, we'll get it down to a fairly similar price. But the, having got into developing electric motors, I mean, they're very interesting things. I mean, most people find them very boring, but they can be quite interesting. We're now on to the next generation and the generation after that. So the important thing about get, getting into developing something is, you, you know, well, as you're developing it, you already know how to do it better. And so you're, you're always two steps ahead of what you're actually selling. Uh, this is the production line in Singapore, actually. We're making this in Singapore. Uh, There it's there are the components. There's a nice balancing machine because you've got balance is absolutely critical if you're running at over 100,000 RPM. Uh, here, here, here's the, there's the telephone business going on. Um, one of the things, you see these machines here, th this is how they're stored in the cupboard. 
And of course, they take up a lot of space. And, you, know, you, you store them in the cloak cupboard, and then you, you um, sort of push it into the coats. And then you want to get a coat out. It pulls the vacuum cleaner over. And then you know, when you want to get your vacuum cleaner out, you pull the coats over. So um, we uh, had a very simple telescopic system and wrapped the hose around the vacuum cleaner. And uh, it makes a very, very, very neat package. Um, oh, I jumped through quite a few slides. Didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Uh, uh, yes. And so, in Japanese homes, they have um, you know very tiny space, a very little space to store anything. So this made it absolutely ideal for storing in a Japanese cupboard. In fact, I think. A and then we did our launch in Japan, and. Uh, we built a little velodrome to demonstrate centrifugal force. And these, I wanted to make the wall a bit see-through, so the wall was made of polycarbonate. And uh, Japanese people, it was at, it's at Roppongi Hills, which is a new development in Japan. And some people went up the stairs, and they were utterly convinced they were robots riding around on the bicycles. In fact, they were real people. Uh, now, we've been developing... This is the home of iRobots. I have to be careful what I say. But, I mean, we've been developing robotic vacuum cleaners for over 10 years now. Um, about four years ago, we tooled up for this robotic vacuum cleaner, which um, navigated absolutely logically and formed a plan of the room and the furniture in it and so on. Um, and you could even move the furniture in the room while it was doing it, and it would cope with that and reconfigure the plan. And when it finished the room, it would know it had done the room because it knew the shape of the room, it knew where it had been, so it knew what it had done, and it also knew what it hadn't done, so it could complete it. The robots on the market at the moment are random robots, which is a very clever system, and it does actually a very good job, except it doesn't know when it's done it, and it doesn't know what it hasn't done. So it doesn't know where it's been, and it doesn't know what it has to do. Interestingly, actually, um, people using a vacuum cleaner don't know where they've been. So what, one of the wonderful advantages of a robotic vacuum cleaner is it <laughs> knows where it's been, knows what, it, knows what it hasn't done, and it can d therefore do the whole room in the most economic manner possible, which a human can't do. Um, now, the, the only pro this had 80 sensors and three computers on board and about 120 battery cells. So it would have cost about $3,000. So although we had tooled up for it, we decided not to launch it. And... As I said earlier, you know, as you're doing something, you always have a better idea and then a better idea. So we're now on to a much better idea, which we'll be launching in the not-too-distant future. Um, but, I mean, there's no doubt robotic vacuum cleaners are part of the future. I just wish we could think of other uses for robotic vacuum cleaners other than vacuuming the house. So if anyone's got any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, there's just the controls of it. Um, now, nothing to do with um, inventions at all, but I was asked to design a, um, a garden at the Chelsea Flower Show, which is the, the main garden show in England. And uh, I, I've always liked Egon Schiele's drawings, and uh, I've been fascinated about making water go uphill. So I decided to make water go uphill. And so there it goes. It goes up here, falls off here, goes up there, falls off there. So it, it goes round this circuit. This is, I built it in the factory before putting it at the garden show. Um, and, uh, well, I don't think you'll see water going uphill anywhere else. I won't tell you how I've done it. But, um, and I, I was quite interested in the idea of glass furniture, which looks as though it'll break or topple over. So I did these glass garden benches. And we just opened the show, and Jerry Hall happened to come along. And so she obligingly sat on the chair for us to take a photograph of. Um, and I also did our border and table. Uh, without any legs, so it's a huge sheet of glass um, just suspended on wires and cross-anchored into the floor. Um, and we learned quite a lot of surprising things doing that because you've got to make a table stable in every direction. Um, and as you can see, the engineer can stand on it, and I think he's sitting on it here. But it's rather nice, I think, the way it floats, uh, and you don't bump into a chair leg at all. Very easy to clean under this. Uh, and that's our research centre in uh, Malmesbury, which is about 100 miles west of London. Um, we have about 
450 engineers and scientists here working on vacuum cleaners and other products, motors, robotics, and other machines that we haven't launched yet. Uh, and we have about three factories in Malaysia where we make our machines, and we're now making other things in China. And uh, the Malaysia Center is also our test center, um, mostly for products that are already being made rather than R&D products, which are mostly tested here. But our 150 um, testers are in Malaysia. Um, and that's the end of my talk, really. But I, I think what I hope I've, I hope that I've followed Buckminster Fuller's principles of not going out selling it, but just doing it. I think that's a terribly important thing. A lot of people get frightened about doing something. They get frightened about starting up a business because they're not a businessman or whatever it is. I'm not a businessman. I don't know how to market anything. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to do it, and I did it. So but Mr. Fuller's lesson was very good. And I think that, that the Isagonis experience with the Mini um, is also very important. I think it's very important to be a designer and an engineer. There's no reason why the two should be separate. During the 20th century, the, the Harvey Earl, the stylist, um, became a profession used by marketeers to tart up products, make them look good. Um, I think in the 21st century, it's time to bring engineering and design together so that engineers design the beautiful products that were produced in the 19th century by engineers. So engineering and design go hand in hand for me. They're not separate professions. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions, but first I'd like to ask you if you could take me on a test drive. <laughs> yeah. I want to see it. Grab hold of that. Release that. There you are. Don't, don't push it around. Walk with it. That's, the, that's what you have to do. And you can, there's a nice bit of dirt there. Anyway. You twist, twist your wrist. Like, that. like this. Do, do, like that. There you go. They say that deans don't do good work. <laughs> <laughs> Productive work. Uh, we'll take some questions, Hannah. So, I, you talk a lot about just doing it, but products don't really just sell themselves um, in and of themselves, for the most part. Um, I think I'm talking about it So, here, in this case, you know, you had a first distributor selling your products, but, you know, if I'm going to buy a vacuum cleaner that's not the cheapest vacuum cleaner, I'm looking at a catalog, what was compelling your first customers to even come to you? Then how did you build upon that and then kind of just build it, this business grow so fast? Well, um, I mean, you're right. You, you've got to explain what you're doing in order to get someone to pay a lot more for your product, or indeed in order to get someone to buy your product at all. So, um, I mean, there's lots of ways of doing it. With, with, the, with a wheelbarrow, the retailers wouldn't take it, so I started with little advertisements in the newspaper, and it actually went very well. It went very quickly. Because I think people, people are looking for new and better things. People aren't totally satisfied with what they've got. And if they see a new and better idea, they're very perceptive. Even non, totally non-technical people can, can see something. Not everybody, but some people can. And once you've got one or two people buying it, if what you've done is a genuine improvement, and that you've, you've really thought about the product and, and, and designed it well, as well as engineered it well, then people talk about it. You know, we had people talking about our vacuum cleaner at dinner parties, for God's sake. And, and you know, that word of mouth is, is the best thing, it's sort of viral selling. And the computer, I mean, the, the internet nowadays is, is a very good viral, I mean, a wonderful viral tool. But also, you, you do have to do advertising. Um, and, you know, shops on the whole won't stock your product unless you're bringing people into their store to buy it. Um, so unfortunately, you have to do advertising. But in all, we're now in 42 markets uh, throughout the world, 42 different countries. But we've never gone in and spent lots of money on advertising. We go in and allow the business to grow organically, and as it grows, we advertise. So I've never invested in advertising. I've always let people to buy the product, see it, and then as they buy it, the, the sales of the product pay for more advertising. As an engineer seeking continual improvement, 
How do you handle the psychological pressure of saying, oh, I'm not quite ready to tune up for another model because it's just a few more improvements? How do you decide? To I give into it. <laughs> I, I often just say we're not ready, as I, indeed I did with the robot. Uh, you know, we're not, we've got a better idea that's going to be much cheaper. Let's do that. And sometimes it's right to do that. And I, um, I was fascinated when I went to Japan to, to, to build the pink and lavender vacuum cleaner because they kept delaying it. You know, they, they would do everything possible not to launch it. And I said, why are you doing this? And they said, ah, we want to get it perfect before we launch it. We can wait 10 years to make a profit, but we must launch a perfect product. So I think sometimes it's better not to rush to market, but to, you know, if you've got a better idea, make the change and then launch it with a better idea. Sometimes you can go on fiddling for too long. So you just have to make that judgment. But uh, I mean, when you launch a product, that initial reception is terribly important. And if you get it wrong, if you get the quality wrong, if you, if you get something wrong there, you can kill it. Uh, so continuing that thread then, was the 5,000 prototypes uh, dominated by a few points or a few areas to work on, or were you perfecting? Well, no, that's a good question. Um, my big problem was that uh, a conventional cyclone, the one like you saw on top of the sawmill, is um, quite good for collecting fine dust, but it won't collect um, human hair, strands of cotton, and large balls of fluff, and dog hair. The things that it won't do. So I puzzled for ages about how to build a cyclone that would... Um, and I, I stumbled quite by accident upon the fact that actually what you wanted to collect those objects was the reverse, the obverse of a cyclone. You wanted to slow the air down, not speed it up. But I, I actually stumbled across it. I didn't logically come to that conclusion because there's no reason why I should. I mean, you know, centrifugal force to separate products seems to be the way to do it. You know? So it was by, quite by accident I discovered I wanted the opposite for centrifugal force to collect all that sort of larger, more difficult stuff. So that was a major milestone. And then um, I had to, a cyclone was traditionally, if you read the book, textbooks, only good down to about 20 microns. Well, a huge amount of house dust is about half a micron. So I had to really improve the efficiency of a cyclone. I had to improve the state of the art of cyclones. And again, I just did that empirically, just building prototype after prototype after prototype, discovering what made things worse and what made them better in a really Edisonian fashion. But um, the big breakthrough was learning how to separate hair and um, strands of cotton and fluff. Interesting objects. <laughs> real customers beyond 150 testers that you have in Malaysia. Uh, you that on your yeah, well, that, that's a good question. I mean, by talking to people, um, we do do focus groups. We do all that sort of thing. And it is interesting, but you mustn't be ruled by it. That was really my point. Um, you know, they'll, they'll give you your opinion, but they won't tell you the future. Uh, you have to guess at that, thank goodness. I mean, it would be, life would be incredibly boring if you could go out and do research and discover what to do. So they're inter it's very interesting to get people's opinions. And people write in letters of complaint. Those are really interesting. I read all of those. And, you know, they bother to sit down and write a letter telling you what's wrong with your product. And it's gold dust. You know, that's what tell it tells you how to improve it or it gives you a good idea how to improve it. Okay. Mm. So you... you um you must have an environment of creativity. You must encourage a lot of creativity among your employees. Mm. Um, how do you codify that to 400 people in three countries throughout your organization? Uh, well, we're, we're actually only in two countries where, where the creativity is taking place, in Malaysia and Britain. Um, although we have a research group here and a research group in Japan. Uh, it's, um, in one sense, it's difficult, and in one sense, it's easy. It's a very difficult question to answer that. And I don't think there's any magic formula. I don't think there are, there are rules that you can obey to do it. I think it's entirely the way you behave and the way you get the organization to behave. Um, I noticed quite early on that it was better to employ people straight from college because they weren't sullied by working at another company. 
So at first, every, everybody, and even now, almost all the engineers came straight from university. And we put them straight onto live projects. And uh, they were fantastic. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And so we, we've given them creative jobs to do, right, and the responsibility right from the beginning. I, I don't believe that, that experience is that important. And uh, so engendering that sort of feeling, that sort of enthusiasm in an organization, that it doesn't matter who you are or what your experience is, it's what you do what you create that's important. So it's, a, it's an everyday thing. It's your everyday reaction to what people say. It's your everyday reaction to ideas. You know, not being cynical when someone, in, in a group, or groups get together and someone makes a silly suggestion and everybody laughs at him. Actually, usually, the silly suggestion is the best suggestion of the year. You know, wrong thinking is the best way to start. Because everybody else starts by thinking the correct things. You start by thinking the wrong things. Although it doesn't work, it can set you off on a different path. And eventually you come to a solution that no one else would have thought of because they're all thinking correctly. So you know, it's stopping people being cynical and laughing at someone who makes a silly suggestion. For example, what someone in our helpline um, suggested putting the helpline number right on the top of the machine in very large letters. And everybody sniggered and said, if you do that, people go in the shop and say, oh, it's going to break down because you put the number right on the top. So we put the number right on the top. And no one sniggered. And um, that meant that anyone using our machine, if anything went wrong or they wanted a spare part, they knew exactly where to find us. And um, our competitors have started copying it after a couple of years. So that kind of wrong thinking and, and just keeping people thinking laterally, thinking incorrectly, making mistakes, and encouraging that uh, is, I think, the way you keep creativity going. But there's no rules. I mean, you just, it's entirely the way you behave every day, I think. One more question. Um, you mentioned that uh, early on, you know, people thought that you were selling high-value goods in high numbers, rather than selling cheaply. Do you think today, by keeping in England and producing in Malaysia, you found a golden combination of the two? Oh, well, of course, lots of questions there. I mean, the, the, um, uh, the, I think the point I was making is that um, what I like doing is designing products where I'm not designing it down to a price. I'm doing what I think a vacuum cleaner should be, a washing machine should be, whatever it is. So, um, and that usually means it ends up being more expensive than people who design down to a price. Um, and the point I'm making, I made earlier was that you can, uh, consumers actually, I think, see that it is good value and you can get a very large market share. We have a 24% share of the American market at, you know, $400 to $600, which is three times the price of everybody else. So we have the biggest market share uh, and we sell by far the most expensive products. So you can do that. So you don't, don't always think you have to design down to a price in order to, get, to have a successful business. That was my first point. Um, your other point about um, des developing products in an expensive country where there's creativity and good engineers and making it in a cheap country, yes, that's the formula that works at the moment. I don't think it'll last for all sorts of reasons. I mean, China and India are outputting 20 times more engineers than there are being produced in the United States and Britain. So they're going to get the engineering and design skills ultimately. Um, so we, we, we won't, at that, I doubt at that stage, whether we'll be able to go on developing products in expensive countries. But on the other hand, the yuan and the Southeast Asian currencies are going to rise fast. And I suspect in about 10 years' time, the yuan will be on the sort of level of the yen. And then maybe the world will turn, turn again. My worry in that is that um, it might then be economic to manufacture in the United States and in Britain but we won't know how to do it. That's my worry. So my worry is a complacency in our countries that we're the best engineers and the best designers, because that will soon be wiped off our faces. Uh, and then our problem is we'll have forgotten how to make things. So that's my depressing view. My optimistic view is that we'll, we will actually turn the corner and start training much more engineers, many more engineers, and stop creating so many media studies and, all the other exciting things, and realize that engineering is exciting, and then science is exciting, and that we'll, there will be a resurgence of science and engineering, 
uh, and we'll be able to fight off the competition. But it's serious, it's going to be a very serious competition. Yeah, good question. Well, I, I started the session yesterday by emphasizing the word invention, the word invention. Um, we've been privileged this afternoon to have one of the world's most exciting and creative inventors and most visible on behalf of MIT and our faculty. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.